Good evening. Um, welcome to the Karl Renner Institute. Uh, my name is Maria Malchnik. I'm the director of uh, the Renner Institute and I'm very happy um, uh, that all of you came. We also have a live stream. Um, so hello to everybody who is watching uh, on the internet. We are having a discussion today uh, which is actually a part of two, two bigger projects. Um, the first project is a conference that started yesterday here at the Renner Institute uh, on the initiative of our partners from the Czech Republic. Um, we, together with the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, short FEPS, invited the Social Democratic Foundations of uh, the CEE region here to Vienna. And uh, we had around 20 participants from, I think, 11 countries uh, who came here yesterday and we had uh, the conference the whole day to discuss common challenges in the region and uh, possible projects, possible topics to work together. Um, um, and also the, uh, the goal was also to find, to build allies, to get to know each other. And I think um, uh, I'm very uh, happy about the outcome of the conference. I'm happy to, um, uh, th that we, uh, everybody of us got to know each other. And I think we will, um, and I'm sure we will continue our conversation. And there's a second project. Um, we, as, a, as the Renner Institute, also wanted to take this chance, uh, to take the chance to have so many um, progressives from so many different countries uh, here in Vienna to work on our narrative, to work on the social democratic narrative. Um, as many of you know, we, we or the, uh, the Austrian social democracy, are not facing uh, exactly quiet times uh, at the moment. We um, uh, we suffered a painful defeat at the general elections a month ago, and um, there there are multiple reasons for that. But uh, one major challenge we face is finding a coherent narrative of like meaning and identity on top of our, uh, in my opinion, very smart policy ideas. Um, we experienced decades of uh, a dominant neoliberal narrative that consisted of market, uh, competition, individuality. Uh, we, we, um, we experienced this narrative all over Europe, actually more than all over Europe. And after this narrative eroded, after the crisis and after several um, um, uh, challenges, the right-wing populists managed to like, jump into the field with a very strong counter-narrative. Um, and this was a narrative of um, homogenous national communities that are supposed to protect the people from the negative um, uh, effects of globalization and of uh, the market dynamics, um, for example. So the challenge is, and our goal is, uh, has to be to work on a progressive narrative that um, finds a space a part of a neoliberal narrative and a right-wing populist narrative of, of nationalism. Um, therefore, the SPÖ installed so-called future labs, or Zukunftslabore, uh, and I would like to see this debate, or a part of this debate at least, um, to be a kind of an unofficial start of these um, future labs. We, um, we are documenting uh, the, key, uh, uh, the, the key issues we will, we will debate today and also the um, uh, the key uh, uh, elements of like uh, the speakers we have here today um, and we hope to harvest and also learn from them. So, so much uh, from uh, the Austrian social democracy. Um, 
Before we start with the panel, I'm happy to welcome Laszlo Andor here today. He is the Secretary General of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, which is like the social democratic political foundation on the European level and our main partner uh, on, a, on a European level. Laszlo has, been, has also been, of course, a, a former Hungarian EU Commissioner for Employment and uh, Social Policy. Um, and yes, thank you for the cooperation because we are uh, having this conference and also this event today um, together. Uh, thank you very much for that um, and for being here today, Laszlo. The floor is yours. Dear Maria, ladies and gentlemen, it is for me a pleasure to be in Vienna and thank you very much for organizing this uh, debate tonight and uh, playing um, the role of uh, the host in this crucial debate. In my view, discussing the East-West divide in the European Union is absolutely a crucial uh, question. The European Union is probably more divided than most of us would be ready to recognize. Um, <coughs> at the same time, we also have to highlight that the East-West asymmetry or imbalance, as economists would prefer to say, um, is not the only one. Very often we do not only speak about an east-west asymmetry but also the north-south imbalance. And you can have a very interesting discussion about which one is more significant, which one is more um, burdensome for the European Union. Uh, the difference, um, I would say, is that in most of the discussion the reference to the east-west question is a political one. It's about constitutional question. It's about the political values of the European Union. It's about the doubts that the Eastern countries, the so-called new member states, have really made a sustainable convergence on the all European political values which are established also in the treaties of uh, the European Union. The North-South divide appears to be uh, a little bit different. Uh, there are much less doubts about the political commitment but there are doubts about the capacity of the European Union to integrate uh, diverse models of different economies, different countries into the same monetary union. Uh, but that just um, uh, 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 makes our task uh, more difficult. Uh, that just makes uh, our task uh, a little bit more difficult when we want to find a kind of uniform solution to all these divides asymmetries. Because on the one hand, um, diversity is something we celebrate. Linguistic, cultural uh, diversity is something which the European Union is supposed to celebrate, but diversity is something different than divergence, whether we speak about economic divergence or political divergence, divergence related to the institutional or constitutional uh, questions. And very often, unfortunately, due to the Hungarian situation, due to the Polish situation, the East-West divergence is discussed in the dimension of uh, uh, political and constitutional issues. And I would be the last one to deny the relevance of, uh, of, of this. FEPS, in Brussels, um, of course, um, is incorporating these questions into the research agenda. FEBS um, has a role, and I would say a privileged capacity in Brussels, um, among the EU institutions, to promote research, the public debate, and also political education in this field, and ensure that the European political debate and the European political process um, takes into account um, the existing uh, tensions, the existing asymmetries in a way that the reform of the policies, the reform of the institutions would lead to better outcomes, including overcoming um, these divides which the discussion will focus on today. I'm absolutely convinced, for example, 
that um, the divide which we speak about uh, today, the East-West issue, is not only a question of values and political institutions, it's also a question of cohesion in a broader sense. What is the experience behind? What is the experience of the 30-year transition in our economy since the fall of the so-called Iron Curtain? And to what extent the 15 years experience inside the European Union was sufficient to overcome some of the anomalies that have been created in the 1990s with the transition uh, to the market economy under a free market laissez-faire uh, paradigm. So, um, in my view, we can only answer the questions of today by looking into the developments of yesterday with an interest in not only a few years, but also a longer time horizon. But our interest should be to, to find answers for the decades ahead. So we, we need to also try to think with um, the mindset of the young generation, which would need to ensure that the European Union of tomorrow would be better balanced and create more opportunities fair working and living conditions for uh, the future. So with this introduction, and um, indeed um, um, with uh, strong support on behalf of FEPS and the interest to, to, uh, to learn um, about um, uh, your views, I would like to uh, give back uh, the floor um, to uh, the distinguished discussants of today's panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> I would like to ask the panelists to come. Yes, <laughs> please take a seat wherever you feel like. No, no. So. Let me introduce uh, our guests tonight. Um, uh, to my right is uh, Mr. Attila Ark, uh, Professor Emeritus at the Corvinus University of Budapest. Um, he recently published a book on um, the fall of democracy in Eastern Europe. Um, on the very right is uh, Paul Schmidt. Uh, Paul Schmidt is uh, the Secretary General of the Austrian Society for European Politics, which is a think tank um, uh, uh, for European politics in, here in Vienna. Um, to my left is Maria Skora from uh, Das Progressive Zentrum in Berlin. She used to, or she is uh, an expert uh, on the on international politics, but especially on the Visegrad um, countries. And to my very left is Magdalena Zelasko, um, who is the director of the Let's See Film Festival in Vienna. C E E. Let's see. <laughs> um, nice. <laughs> I would like to start with Maria. Um, Maria, you're writing, uh, as I said, a lot about the countries of the Visegrad group. How do you see the developments there? Um, I mean, there, what we discussed today, uh, there have been promising developments recently. Uh, there were the uh, regional elections in Hungary where the opposition could uh, take over Budapest. Uh, there was a, um, a, co a progressive coalition in Poland um, uh, with a very strong result uh, in the last elections. How do, do you see that there is kind of a movement? And uh, yeah, um, do you see the possibility of like establishing a strong progressive movement also in this area? And if yes, how? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, there, there are many questions in one, I would say, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, good evening, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, um, I think, well, if we look at the Visegrad, it's far more diverse than we think. Well, Czechia, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, th four countries uh, with four different political 
um, uh, cultures and, and uh, traditions. However, two of them are very present in the public debate, especially uh, abroad in, on a European level, Hungary and Poland, of course, because of the developments there, democratic backsliding, and amazing success of uh, the Law and Justice Party in Poland and, and Viktor Orban uh, in, in Hungary. Um, I would say um, I wouldn't like to maybe talk too much about Hungary having a distinguished uh, expert specialist and native from the but you, you're more than welcome to do that. I feel really uh, uh, not in the position <laughs> to, to elaborate too much on that. But um, I think, yeah, um, last Sunday, probably uh, not last Sunday, actually 10 days ago, you all know, uh, there was local elections in uh, Hungary as well as parliamentary elections in Poland. And in fact, we have seen, we have observed a spark of hope Whereas I'm not so sure about Hungary because it's the victory of the opposition in Budapest, uh, whereas the rest of the country, from what I understand, is still a stronghold, uh, more or less, of the Fidesz uh, party. Uh, but in Poland, indeed, the left-wing coalition, the joint effort of three parties, three generations of, of uh, progressive actors, um, has made it back to the parliament. Uh, for those of you who may not know, 2015 elections have left the Polish parliament without the representation of the left. So, well, that's already a success, even though if it's only 12 and a half percent, as far as I remember, of all votes, uh, that's already something that gives hope and is in qualitative change. But uh, if you were asking about the um, perspective of building a progressive movement and how to do it. And I would suggest, how about we look, um, um, okay, that's uh, a bit um, maybe controversial, but how about we look on those who already are successful and let's look about the law and, uh, at the Law and Justice Party, uh, which definitely celebrated a, their victory um, on October 13th. 43% uh, of the Law and Justice Party and its two coalition uh, partners, junior coalition partners, two satellites, is perhaps not what they were uh, counting for. The opinion polls, some of the opinion polls before the elections were uh, giving the Law and Justice Party even 48, 49% of, of support. And comparing to Viktor Orban as our point of reference, 43 might be a little um, lame result, <laughs> especially if we think about Viktor Orban's 52% uh, in uh, 2010. But yes, unquestionably, there is strong and mobilized support for the um, law and justice, and that's hence also the agenda. Never, nevertheless, there were some snippy comments after, after the election results were um, uh, published that Polish people have sold democracy for social transfers um, because the law and justice actually is known for having kept their election promise and, and promises for 2015 and having uh, fulfilled what they uh, obliged themselves to fulfill. I think it's a, not a fair uh, comment to say, um, where first of all, um, there is not such a unite, united uh, unit as Polish, uh, Polish people itself. Also, when taking raw numbers uh, of votes, um, the s f fragmented opposition actually uh, won more votes than uh, the Law and Justice Party, won almost one million more votes. However, the don't method used in uh, translating the election results into the seats in Parliament has given the Law and Justice Policy Party absolute majority in that Parliament. But um, back to the point, um, let's look why the Law and Justice Party is actually so popular and why they are winning. Uh, first of all, I've already mentioned, as they promised 2015 to introduce um, generous uh, social policy program and abandon that narrative of Poland being a developing country, poor country, country still working their way up. Um, the promise of more fair redistribution and actually using the wealth of the country that the country has um, accumulated during the, uh, the last 10 years. They really delivered what they promised. And I think many voters have, for the first time in a long time, felt taken seriously. And the second point is that these general social programs, they really improve the lives of many people, many Polish families. And after uh, eight years of uh, liberal or even neoliberal governments that were pursuing that uh, idea of a small state, of, of cheap state, uh, that was a um, definitive, definitive difference uh, to shrink 
the socioeconomic gaps within the Polish society. And I think, of course, there, that, that promise also came with or many negative changes as a package uh, with um, um, dismantling judiciary or taking over public media. But at the end of the day, I think uh, it resonates with some part of Polish electorate um, that um, improving my own situation or my family's situation is far more important than um, such abstract uh, ideas like um, judiciary, democracy, and so on. And um, I don't, uh, perhaps one could think it's cynical. I don't think it's cynical. I think it's pragmatic. Uh, and um, to sum up, um, I think there cannot be democracy without solidarity. And, and by that, I mean, we have to, as social democracy, I think that's a lesson we could learn from the electoral um, victory of uh, the social, uh, of the law and justice, that what's really important is to um, take a step back and uh, define the challenges and problems of post-capitalism, of, 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 of the capitalism that we are living now, and to try to um, develop the agenda that would appeal to um, broader sectors of the society and also put it forward in a language that is uh, possible to uh, understand. Um, of course, right-wing or far-right, uh, right-wing populists are also employing um, rhetorics based on, based on hate or very negative um, message, um, excluding be it refugees, LGBT community, and so on. That, uh, in my opinion, we are absolutely not allowed to do. And that's why preaching love is always more, more, more difficult than preaching hate. However, we should try and um, be it, um, yeah, I would say um, there are social cultural factors and all the polit identity politics that is very important in decomposing why right wing populism or illiberal tendencies are, are popular. But I think as social democracy, we have to go back to the roots and ask the question about fair and modern redistribution models in our country. Thank you very much. I have a brief follow-up uh, question. Do you think the Polish people don't believe that the Social Democrats would fight for them as much as the uh, Law and Justice Party does? Because you said uh, the Law, uh, Law and Justice um, promised uh, a very progressive social model. The Social Democrats didn't? It's not progressive. It's actually very archaic because um, uh, social policy based on social transfers is like uh, very so 70s or so 60s. But uh, so it's a very ar archaic model of, a of, of social policy. However, in the short run before it, um, uh, inflation kicked in, it really made a difference uh, to many, many families. Um, I, well, social demo, well, social Democrats. Right now, their left-wing coalition, as I as I mentioned, three generations and three different party left-wing parties or social liberal parties that um, are present in the parliament. So it's on the one hand like the Polish Syriza, the Ra Razem, which is more far right and maybe um, bottom-up movement. That's the um, uh, social democracy of the SLD, uh, um, um, Left Democratic Alliance, and then the new movement of Robert Piedron and his social liberal. Um, uh, movement or party, I well, I'll ask myself a question. This is already three different visions of Poland, of the welfare state. I ask myself a question if they will be first and most um, able to meet in the center and develop um, a consistent and coherent uh, vision for what there should be implemented. But to answer your question, I think it was also difficult for uh, progressive actors, for progressive figures to get through to the general public in the last four years, not having representative in the parliament. So the issue of strategy and policy, uniting on this and then uh, fast forward, charge ahead with appealing to the citizens and showing the alternative. We don't have to live in a generous but intolerant right wing state. Uh, we can, um, politics can be different and Poland can be different. Thank you. Um, Attila Ak, you wrote um, a book, uh, it's called, 
we can show it to, uh, we can show it to, it's called Declining Democracy in East Central Europe. You've been working on democracy questions in, uh, uh, in the region for a long time. Um, what are your, um, what is your view on the current situation? And um, also, as I know that you've been working on the, on questions of narratives, um, uh, that's what I read on um, in your uh, in your CV. Um, do you see a, do you see a space for a progressive social democratic project in the region, and um, and what is a possible political focus? I would like to go against the mainstream here. Uh, I think it's uh, very misleading if we are asking about special reasons for the Orban regime in Hungary or for the electoral success of peace uh, in Poland and so on. Uh, my book is about the region and there are no country chapters, but there is a long analysis about the economic progress, uh, about the social transformation, about the political systems, and so on, of the region. Because this is a common history, and this is a common... Uh, this book is a self-criticism. Uh, in the 90s, I published uh, several books in the West uh, about the same region. And it was full of optimism, I would say even euphoria. This hasn't happened to us. This is indeed a failure in several ways. And if we are discussing east-west divide, then we haven't forget about the east-west divide within East Central Europe. If you draw a line, uh, from dance, from north to south, you will see that all the countries are partitioned. Please check the list of not two regions, the official EU publications. You will see that some parts of our countries, all of them, belong to west of the east. Some other parts, very characteristically also in Poland, east of east. These are two worlds apart. And those who live in the east of the east uh, have a much lower civilization uh, than 30 years ago. They are absolute losers. So if we are asking the questions as scholars or scientists, why these uh, uh, right-wing movements or uh, uh, you can uh, have a lot of terms, uh, of course, uh, we overuse the term of, uh, uh, of uh, deviation from the European mainstream and, and the questions like that. Uh, we have to realize that that project, but started in the early 90s, we call it systemic change. And also that project, it started 15 years ago with the EU membership, has been a failure. And the only way out if we face the facts, let me uh, show what way it was a failure and what is the main problem. Namely, uh, the East-West divide would have uh, deserved some kind of special treatment of the new member states. And if you start a competition with stronger states and weaker states, you can see the result in advance. And this is what happened. Common conditions, please compete, it doesn't work. Cohesion policy waters failure, uh, at the end of the last year, the EU published a long documentary about upward convergence is a failure. It's not my opinion, it's a 
uh, it's a thick documentation book from the EU. And not just from that side, what I have just mentioned, that failure that east of the east, but there is a very important other distinction, namely catching up quantitatively or catching up qualitatively. Namely, if we specify as economists, first of all, there is a GDP-based approach. You can point out that several countries have some progress in the GDP. Poland, thank you. Yes, but, but this is just reaching the past of the older member states, not the present, not the new structures. We are the low skill, low cost periphery of the European Union. It is not a progress, even if there is some progress in the GDP. If you look at the figures of the education, healthcare, research, and development, you will see that all these countries, please read it, all the statistics are there, it's much below what means the modern production, what means the modern way of life. So we are trying to reach the past of Austria, Germany, and all that. All reproducing that structures in GDP-wise, GDP doesn't mean anything nowadays for the economics. Well-being, yes. Human investment, social context. This is the modern economy. And all these countries are in worse situation than they were 10 years ago. Look at the investment in education. Look in the investment uh, for social care and at health care and so on. You will see that there are very crude figures. These have been worsening. So, if we go back to that situation 30 years ago, we shouldn't forget that there was indeed a scholar who realized the situation. It's called Ralph Darendorf. He issued warnings several times, but we didn't listen to, including myself. We were optimistic. I say even more euphoric. What he said was that there are three different lines of development, very easy legal political change. Uh, let's use his words, six months, no problem. Some kind of introduction of, of market economy, okay, okay, six years. But changing the societies. He said, 60 years. We have eaten up half of it, 30 years. And uh, I have to tell you that there is a deep credibility crisis in our countries. European project has gone and we are weaker and weaker and therefore people feeling weak, they say that they are proud European citizens. It is not a contradiction. Because they are weak and they don't see a future themselves. Therefore, they say that we are belonging to Europe. Because they need, in this world of desecuritization, some kind of security. And Europe is the last security for my people in Budapest or for your people in Ljubljana and elsewhere. I have just recently read a paper about a, a Slovenian situation and I was simply shocked about the people situation and approach to the European narrative. So, yes, we can have a narrative but it's a narrative can't be as it was the import 
of Western model of development, meaning that, that we can repeat uh, the Western model of catching up by copying it and believing that we will do it uh, in a shortened way. Uh, in my book, I try to uh, describe what I call uh, Juncker paradox. Juncker paradox is that the general situation of the EU is that we have always cycles, crises, we have always a lot of problems, therefore we marginalize certain problems. This is what you can see describing the five years of the Juncker Commission. Uh, what are the Juncker's answers to the East-West divide? Yes, yes, I understand, please wait. And this counterproductive situation is the Juncker uh, paradox. The situation is much worse than it was five years ago due to the benign neglect of the European Commission and uh, the European Union. Not realizing that special cases, not just in that part of the world I am talking about, but in other parts of the world. Uh, what Fritz uh, Sharp uh, told, uh, judicial transition, judicial integration doesn't work, doesn't work. We have facade institutions in Poland, in Slovakia, everywhere. Facade democracies, nothing behind. This is just on the paper, on the constitution. The first six months, and democracy has been emptied in our part of the world, completely. Therefore, Juncker paradox may be continued as uh, Leiden paradox. It's okay. Again, saying now Brexit, tomorrow this and that. Why to uh, deal with these issues? Unimportant. And these people are not uh, grateful to us uh, for this integration process. The integration philosophy was mistaken. Uh, there is a Copenhagen learning process. This is not my turn. Namely, learning that uh, from the very beginning of the Copenhagen criteria, this process has not been well planned. There is a large literature about that. So, narrative. Uh, it is not my narrative. Please take the paper. Uh, what I just mentioned, December uh, uh, 2018, EU publication, upward convergence is needed. But this needs also the specificity, solving not all part of the world. The Greek issue may be so much different uh, from the uh, Baltic situation. You shouldn't have this benign neglect about the region specificities, and that can be a solution if we have an upward convergence. The European Policy Center published a paper just some months ago, and uh, a very nice scholar whom I like very much, maybe mispronouncing his name, Emanulidis, Yanis Emanulidis, wrote a terrible sentence. And sorry, finishing with that, he said that the uh, member states of the European Union is looking like being on different planets. And it is his sentence at his words. So if you would like to stop it, please stop the Juncker paradox, benign neglectance, not dealing with specialties, this is one region with the same problems. Zeman is saying the same stupidities as Orban. They are from the same school. So, uh, to deal with special issues in a special way, understanding the problem, as a political scientist, I stop here, I can 
have key words for, for you, the political participation, economic participation, real life behind uh, the democratic uh, institutions. This has been hopelessly emptied in our countries. You just see the scenery and nothing is behind. Hungary, uh, as we said, but also Poland is very far from any kind of democracy. What we have there, it is not democracy. Even if there are some small steps, uh, we had a big victory on the 13th of October, okay, but this is still not a democracy. This is an autocracy in which uh, there are some elements. Elections. Uh, okay, so uh, it's, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation again, and I know that in, in the anti Greece, those uh, messenger boys uh, were killed who brought with them uh, bad messages. So I hope that I can escape tomorrow morning to Budapest. We usually don't do it here, <laughs> killing the messenger. Um, so, Paul, um, so we jump uh, over the border uh, to the, um, we, we sat together before and then we were, we were talking about as a Viennese, uh, are you Western European or are you Central European? And uh, we said we, uh, it's somewhere in between because Vienna is so much more East than Prague. So the concept of East and West, the geographical <laughs> concept of East and West is a bit mixed up. But uh, anyways, uh, from, an, from an Austrian point of view, um, how do you see this East-West divide? Do you, did you hear about the Juncker paradox before? <laughs> um, do, you, um, do you share Ms. Hark's, uh views? Um, and um, yes, and how do you see it from your, uh, you, from the point of your work? Thank you very much for the question and for the invitation. Um, this, is, this is an interesting discussion and uh, I think Attila was very nice to finish uh, his intervention uh, with this sentence that please don't kill the messenger, we won't, we never do. But I think it's important to bring in a, a conflictive, um, critical but constructive position in order to discuss the issues. And I'm very much tempted to to respond to what you have been saying, of course. Um, I, I do share some of the arguments, uh, in particular the one that you have mentioned, that the planning of EU enlargement uh, had uh, many downturns and, and um, today it, it would have been done differently maybe. But on the other hand, the question also is what would have been the cost of, of non-enlargement? I think that's also an, an interesting question to look at. Um, on the uh, euphoria, I think that's, that, uh, that is a, a very important point you made, um, which is um, still um, something which we have to confront because in general, uh, on the different planets within the European Union, because we're all on a different planet, I agree. Um, expectation management is, is not well done, I think, because the way national politicians talk about European developments um, works with an expectation management as if, if we meet on a weekend on Monday, everything will be solved. And I think that's, uh, that's, that would need a, a, a reality check because um, this, this will never happen. Um, I also very much agree that East-West divide is, of course, a great title, but it does not reflect reality. Because as you have mentioned, there's a West-East divide, there's an East-East-East divide within the region, and there's very much a pattern which we also see uh, in other member states where you have a strong divide between 
the capitals, the cities, the urban areas, and the rural areas very much. And this is, for example, uh, if you look at, at, at Slovakia, I think, the, but not only, of course, but, but this is something which we, um, which, which we see and which we also have to deal with in, 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 in other member states, of course. Um, I wouldn't say that it has been a failure, and the, I mean, but I agree with the argument that the catching up process is it's much slower than than it was actually promised to be, and that there are, that there is a lot of uh, disillusion disillusion with this um, um, with 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 these developments. But the question is, I mean, we we, we cannot change what have, we've been doing in the past. The question is what we do now, and how can we actually. Um, improve the situation. Um, I agree with the with with your argument that uh, if we look at GDP and if you just look at it from the economic point of view and from traditional way of of uh, defining uh, the economic development of of countries, uh, the picture would be different because we would see that convergence is actually happening, growth rates are higher. But uh, it's not about quantity, it's also about quality and the well-being and the social dimension and who reaps the benefits of this, invita of this integration um, and uh, what are the costs, what are the benefits and what, what do people actually uh, benefit from it. I don't agree with the Juncker paradox um, because uh, it's, it's, it's easy to, to, to blame the European Commission but if you look at it in detail, I mean, why not criticize them? Of course we should, but if you look at it in, in detail, um, there were and there are and there will be many, many proposals on how to improve certain situations and how to, um, to manage challenges uh, which we face, but um, those, mo some of them legislative proposals, are then blocked uh, by, by, by the by the council, so I think other member states are the ones that we should be talking about. If you if you think of just um, uh, his, his um, saying goodbye in the European Parliament, Juncker was very clear that uh, the fact that uh, Greece is still a member of the Eurozone is um, due to um, a strong insistence uh, by the European Commission and some EU member states, but other EU member states, would have been very comfortable with having Greece leaving uh, the euro area. Um, if you look at uh, the, the issue of uh, starting enlargement negotiations, uh, you have a similar picture. Criteria, criteria is fulfilled, European Commission proposes, and, um, and some member states have their, have their veto. So I think um, it's a more of a, of a, a member state a paradox um, which talk a lot, but then action proves them, proves their rhetoric wrong. And I think that's something uh, we should look at. And again, that's where you're right. Uh, member states are very much on a different planet and on a different planet. And the planets differ from member state to member state. And they're very much in their national public sphere. And Juncker called them once uh, weekend Europeans. And I think that's true because um, national politics do have a European p a responsibility which they don't uh, spend enough. I remember um, a, a Greek colleague who said maybe it's even the case that many national governments are just not fit to, to, to actually um, live up to their European responsibility. But this is the structure which we have and the question is uh, not so much the analysis of the current situation, but how do we get out of this? Um, there are many things that divide East and West uh, that are regional divisions in the East and in the West and no South uh, divide, as, as Laszlo said. Um, maybe what we are lacking here is um, a sense of um, better understanding and listening more and just talking more to each other to understand where we are and how this can actually be dealt with. And maybe the focus should be uh, very much on how to translate economic successes on paper into social progress uh, on the ground. And 
that might be might be very naive, but I think um, that's one way to go. But that doesn't that doesn't uh, keep us from uh, scrutinizing very carefully what is going on uh, with um, in terms of European values and and the rule of law. I think that's that's crucial. There's no room for compromise there. Um, the way we deal with it could be different, but but I think um, if we compromise there, we will we will probably it will probably be be the end of, of European integration, which is actually based on rules and and values. Um, and I think uh, there, there there was one um, smart Austrian um, actor who once said that member states um, that form that together form uh, the European Union they have signed up to something but they don't really remember what they signed up to and I think that's something that we have to, to constantly remind them and discuss with them and with in particular the civil society how how these what what the member states actually signed up for and how this can be can it be implemented and what is the reasoning behind it i think there's no 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 room for complacency there we have to constantly repeat ourselves because it's not self-evident that things will stay as as they are and my last point would be um but i'm now um i'm uh i'm it, it's true that I haven't really haven't really answered your question, but <laughs> but my my anyway I think there will be other rounds. But but my my last point would be um, that uh, because because I mentioned the sensibility and the better understanding of each other and the way of talking to each other, and uh, to give you one example to 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 show what what I mean, uh, we we usually do on a regular basis opinion polls, and there's one opinion poll. Uh, regarding future enlargements and we always ask what the public opinion is on this and that country becoming member of the European Union just to get an idea of how the public feels about it. And the public perception is, is very negative regarding future enlargement. It wasn't like that um, with, with the last enlargements in 2004 and 2007. Um, and this is one of the few examples where the Austrian government, the Austrian governments, no matter what uh, what coalition we talk about, they they have one of the few examples where they don't follow public opinion, and they actually have a an, an interest to reach out to uh, southeastern Europe, which is of course also an economic interest, an historic interest, geographical interest, etc. But they stick to it because they say it's something which we do on a medium term, and the public opinion is a short term thing, and it might be improving. Um, and that's that's interesting to see. And I remember going to Bratislava to meet one of our uh, colleagues there from from another um, um, institute which we work with in Bratislava. And I told him about this this data, and I told him that you know um, the worst um, the, the worst result is of course uh, welcome to Austria. It's it's always Turkey, but but then then Albania doesn't really have a good public image here. And, and then his answer was, and I still remember it today, his answer was, well, you know, at least Albania does have an image in Austria. But we, are as, as, as Slovakia, we're just uh, less than an hour away, and no one in Austria really cares about us. No one really comes to Bratislava to talk to us, and it seems like two different planets, apart from the different planets which we have in our own countries. And I think that's something very striking. And I thought about it, and I said, "Well, he's he, he's right," and um, and that's something I think we have to change. And I I might be naive, but but I still think that uh, with all the failures and all the problems and all the challenges which we have with these divisions, um, this this is nothing that we can give up on. But this is something that we have to build on the successes that we see and have to make sure that, that these failures are repaired and that the wider public actually also understands the, the value added, not only economically, but also politically, of, of being part of the European integration process. Thank you. I think you have to switch off your... Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, you answered many questions, so I'm satisfied. <laughs> um,
Um, just to also to contextualize your critique towards uh, member states and the Council, of course, we were all very disappointed last week when the European Council didn't agree on opening the accession talks with North Macedonia and uh, Albania, and this was um, uh, this was actually France's um, fault. And uh, um, yes, I think you. Uh, what we saw last week was that there are limits, and the uh, and the European Council and like the power of the member states. Um, if if there is n not a common um, vision and uh, and some member states can't live up to that it's a problem um you also the, you already mentioned the uh, civil society and i would like to switch to to magdalena magdalena Celasco, um for social dem for social democracy so, uh, civil society initiatives and cultural in initiatives are always important allies um, especially in regions uh, or countries um, where the party structures are not that strong because in, in um, many cases people who are active in civil society movements are, are highly educated, highly motivated and have uh, strong capacities to, um, uh, to also fight for a free, equal and solidary societies. Um, which potential um, strategies for like both nationalism and neoliberalism do you see, and especially in the in the CE area? Uh, thank you for the question and for the invitation. Um, indeed, um, uh, there is a lot to do for civil societies in uh, in the region because. Um, uh, the governments are coming uh, with uh, new pictures of enemies almost every week or every month. So, of course, um, the civil society um, reacts uh, with the positive image and with protests. Um, and this is uh, what the international media also noticed, that there are a lot uh, of people on the streets and um, um, the methods of uh, protests are very creative sometimes. Um, However, um, it's not possible to, uh, to talk um, about Hungary, Poland and Slovakia and so on uh, as a one region because every country has um, own systems and sometimes um, the civil societies succeed uh, and sometimes not. Uh, for example, um, now in Hungary, uh, when the Central European University moved to Vienna, or rather to say was banned uh, to Vienna, uh, now um, another NGOs are targeted by the government. So there is a um, uh, try to um, force them to register it, um, as a foreign uh, financed institutions as soon as they receive more than 23,000 euros, I think. So um, it's not um, so much deal you could think, but uh, of course in the heads of the people, it will be like they are receiving foreign money, so they uh, serve foreign interest. And we can um, remember what happened in Russia when a similar law was uh, um, also invented uh, that uh, there were hundreds of NGOs they closed because uh, they lost the trust from the society. They were seen like uh, foreign agents in the country. Um, for example, in Poland, um, it's not that case so far, but um, I have the feeling that the, um, sometimes uh, some special NGOs are picked up as examples and um, one of the biggest enemies of the um, government is uh, the biggest charity uh, called, um, uh, you can translate it like a big orchestra of um, Christmas charity with almost 30 years of tradition. And they are collecting money, uh, among others, for hospitals. And they are the biggest of that kind in Poland, the biggest charity action. And uh, what happened uh, this year? Um, the mayor of Gdańsk, uh, who was uh, collecting money all the day, was stabbed on the stage uh, and murdered. He died uh, one day after. Um, it's important to say um, that um, 
um, the head of the charity and also this mayor uh, were critic of the government. Um, however, they did it in a very um, subtle way, I would say. They never uh, used the language of hate. And um, so, um, for example, um, both uh, received uh, so-called certificates of date uh, from, from um, youth organizations. Um, and um, it was very uh, widely uh, reported um, internationally, and a lot of people um, were sure something will happen. It cannot be like that, the, that the innocent people are killed, and it, um, it's a part of politics, because a lot of people uh, connected this to this um, really aggressive language, and not really something happened. So. Um, we see now the same language and, and the same uh, enemies. Um, while, for example, in Slovakia, after um, the journalist um, Jan Kusak was murdered, it, uh, it um, changed the system. So now the new president uh, was elected mainly because uh, there were massive protests and um, suddenly um, new topics were possible. Um, so um, uh, we will see how it um, will um, uh, develop in that countries. Uh, what is uh, good uh, that now in the uh, era of internet, of social media, everyone can be part of, uh, of civil society and it's much, much easier nowadays to, to be part of it. Um, for example, um, again, um, after this, uh, tragic death in Gdańsk, and Gdańsk was also kind of um, one of the biggest symbol in Poland because uh, it's the birthplace of Solidarność and it's a topic um, where, for example, um, um, it, it's, it, this mayor was, for example, uh, very open towards migrants and, and uh, he wanted uh, to take um, some certain um, number of migrants and welcome them in uh, the Ming Daisk. Um, and there was an action when uh, one of the biggest charity uh, on Facebook happened when the people decided to collect money uh, to uh, fill this uh, charity box of this murdered mayor. And it was really one of the biggest action ever. I, I don't really, I think it was the biggest one in the region when they collected several million euros and um, and make it and did it happen um, so um, and again uh, social media and crowdfunding uh, campaigns uh, when you um, see uh, of course the artists and journalists are more prominent parts of civil society but of course um, everyone can be um, a lot um, of artists know they uh, won't receive um, funding for their projects, so they appeal to so civil society and make a very important project uh, happen. And I see them also as a very uh, important part of um, civil movement. Um, maybe you have heard um, about the film, uh, which was produced uh, also a few months ago and premiered shortly because, uh, before European election. Uh, and it uh, thematized uh, the topic of pedophilia in the Polish church. And the director collected um, all the money um, in a crowdfunding campaign. And um, again, a lot of people uh, were sure uh, when this documentary, um, which uh, was already seen by 25 million uh, viewers on YouTube, uh, completely for free, uh, if it uh, will be released uh, shortly before um, election, something will happen. And then uh, what you can see now, uh, this attacks um, against LGBT society, this was um, the answer uh, from, um, from the party because um, um, suddenly um, kind of new enemy had to be found. So they targeted LGBT. And uh, this is also something what will uh, be uh, present um, in the Polish uh, reality uh, for a long time, I'm afraid. And uh, because we also know that uh, the leaders um, in the region are very well connected and they, uh, they are copying uh, the ideas, 
probably this will be also a strong topic um, in Hungary or in Czech Republic, um, because um, this is something what um, completely um, illustrates um, this uh, divide between uh, East and West, uh, between um, model of uh, traditional family and even uh, Jarosław Kaczyński um, a uh, few months ago repeated that the normal family for him is a family with mother and father and not with two mothers and two fathers. So he uh, plays this opposites uh, quite well. And of course, um, uh, there are some uh, reaction as well, but, uh, but so far not so strong. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so we will um, see what, what will happen. And um, um, also, my festival, which I uh, was, uh, which was, um, which is in Vienna since tw 2012, I saw it um, as well as a part of uh, civil um, society because uh, it was uh, done mainly uh, with volunteering work, and uh, for me it was important uh, since so many migrants from Central and Eastern Europe are living um, in Vienna and uh, before the. Um, 2015, um, from 10 uh, biggest um, groups uh, of migrants living in Vienna, uh, nine of them were from Central Eastern Europe. The biggest, of course, was uh, from Germany. So uh, for me, it was important to bring the people together and to um, also fight, fight against stereotypes because there were a lot of stereotypes also um, before the Eastern enlargement, um, some of them were spoken and some of them were unspoken. Um, the pictures on, on television when you saw the Romania or Poland, like a rural uh, uh, landscape and uh, it was, uh, or, or um, masses of, of people looking for a job abroad. Um, and um, only one example, of, why it's important uh, to to appeal to the society uh, with culture. Um, we uh, were the fir were the first festival in Austria uh, which presented um, documentary about Oleg Sensov. Um, and um, after the screening, um, there was a letter from Austrian directors, a letter of support for Oleg Sensov. And of course, um, there were a lot of initiatives um, in, in Europe and in the world, but um, all together um, were able, I hope I have the feeling to to do something and uh, to, to help to release him. Um, and um, a solution which um, also could help uh, to, to bring people together and to um, offer some different pictures and not um, enemies only, it's, um, in my opinion, education of, of young people and uh, to reaching them because once they uh, leave school, they will be independent and they probably never will find uh, a way to to some culture um, offer. But uh, when, uh, uh, when they are at school and they uh, visit um, screening and discussions with people, they are really European. And also to be European is for me not only to um, to admire European Union without uh, any doubts, but also to, to say what is uh, wrong and uh, what could be done. Um, so it's the way to, um, to make them feel um, this um, European identity. And I can remember before the European election, we offered a series of uh, youth cinema together with European Commission. And even in Austria, uh, in one city, um, I was there at the discussion and um, the children like or the teenies with 15, they had no idea why it's important to be in European Union and what European Union gave them. And after one hour discussion, uh, you had the feeling they, um, they know already. <laughs> nice story. So we have an audience full of experts. Um, and I would suggest uh, like to open the floor towards uh, the audience to give you the possibility to ask questions and to also to intervene. Is anybody? 
Yes, please. And please, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, my name's Carl Owens. Um, I'm actually from 